A sail, a sail. We had succeeded. What a glorious sight that was, the distant outlines of a wailing vessel in the west. It meant the end of years of hope and toil, for that vessel had come from San Francisco through the Bering Strait and along the north coast of Alaska, and where its deep belly had floated, we could float, so that all doubts of our success in the making of the Northwest Passage were at an end. Victory was ours! For centuries, mariners have set out on the quest to find the sea route that connects the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans via the north, a northwest passage between Western Europe and Asia. During the time of early naval explorers, such a route would have revolutionized exploration and trade and would have brought riches to the first country that found it. Stories of exotic spices, foods, kingdoms, and riches in the Far East fueled the explorers' passions. The first major expeditions began near the end of the 15th century. At this time, the Ottoman Empire had blocked European trade routes by land through the eastern Mediterranean and Near East. The safe warm weather routes to the south were long detours, and Spanish and Portuguese trading interests tightly guarded the routes. In this time, much of the world was unknown. Maps only reflected the best interpretations of hand-collected data. Shipbuilding was on the cutting edge of technology and oceanic exploration was the equivalent of today's space exploration. The first serious expeditions began in the early 1500s. Sebastian Cabot, born in Venice and educated in England, launched a northern expedition in 1509 in the spirit of his father, John Cabot, who had sailed along the northern coast of North America in 1497 in search of a passage. Sebastian sailed into Hudson Bay but was forced to turn around due to an unruly crew and lack of supplies. To an early explorer, this great sea must have seemed like a grand opening into another world, although it was actually nothing but a large landlocked bay. In 1542, Jacques Cartier sailed through the Gulf of St. Lawrence and upriver through the St. Lawrence Seaway to reach present-day Montreal. He wrote in his logbook, We found a large and beautiful bay full of islands and good entrances. Unlike Cabot, who had tried to skirt around the continent to find a northern route, Cartier sailed through the heart of Canada and stopped in present-day Montreal. Centuries passed by, and more and more explorers attempted to reach a northern passage. In 1745, the British Parliament established a 20,000-pound prize for the first captain that could successfully sail all the way to the Pacific through the north. It was not until 1853 that Robert McClure finally made it. To illustrate the difficulties of his expedition, it took him four years, two ships, and a long intermediate journey across the ice on a sled to find a second ship. In fact, he didn't technically complete the passage by boat, but he laid the groundwork for adventurers to come. On October 19, 1906, Roald Amundsen finally completed the passage completely by sea over 400 years after Cabot's first daring voyage. The warmer summer months had allowed him to slip through receding ice passages and sail around the Alaskan coast to San Francisco Bay. One of history's most elusive challenges was finally achieved. Today, the perils of the Northwest Passage have dramatically decreased. New technology in shipbuilding now allows ships to break through the ice and forge a path through waters that would have been previously impossible to navigate. And the ice conditions are changing in a way that has never been seen before. The Northwest Passage is so perilous and difficult to navigate because of the Arctic sea ice that clogs navigation routes. Imagine McClure's ship, lodged between two ice sheets, being pounded with wind, ice, and snow. It would be almost impossible to dislodge a ship from such conditions. Sea ice, however, is not always in the same place from one year to the next. In the winter, freezing cold temperatures create ice that blocks off most routes. In the summer, warmer temperatures melt some of that ice and the routes open. When Amundsen sailed from May to October, he entered the passage during the melting season. He likely would not have made it through if he had left in November when the ice was refreezing. When ice has been frozen thick for a long time, it takes a longer time to melt. When freezing temperatures come back, it refreezes as much as or thicker than before. This is why sea ice fluctuates both up and down. 
In recent years, however, dramatic changes have occurred to the sea ice in the north. The immense reserve of ice that historically held up to melting is now weakening. Each summer, the total area of ice becomes thinner and more susceptible to melting during the following year. Warmer winter temperatures do not refreeze the ice to a greater thickness, and it melts even quicker than before. The change in sea ice over the last 40 years has been unforeseen in history. Measurements from September 1970 to September 2007 show that during this period, the amount of sea ice in the north has decreased 1.4 million square kilometers, an area two times the size of Texas. In order to find out information about such a large area, climatologists and scientists use satellite detection systems that orbit the Earth. The satellites measure accurate day-to-day -day information about sea ice concentration, surface area, and even thickness. After a warm, clear, sunny summer in 2007, the Arctic sea ice decreased to the lowest amount ever recorded. During September 2007, such little ice blocked the various routes of the Northwest Passage that it was considered completely open for an entire month of satellite observations. It is not likely that the sea ice will come back either. When there is less ice in the summer, the sun's energy works more efficiently to heat the water and the ice. The white color of the ice reflects most of the energy back and stays cool. But the blue water absorbs solar energy and warms up. Even if the water warms one degree, it increases the melting of sea ice. In the future, a lack of sea ice will increase the warming of the ocean even more, which will have consequences all over the world. A study published by the Russian Academy of Sciences predicts that it will be at least 10 and likely 20 years before commercial traffic will begin to use the Northwest Passage. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has projected that if current trends continue, a summer without sea ice in the Arctic will occur in the next 40 to 100 years. These current trends refer to human activity and pollution. The melting of the sea ice is related to both human-caused and natural variations in climate, such as the clear summer of 2007 that reduced sea ice so much. Humans can have a direct effect on sea ice by fracturing it with icebreaker boats. These large ships break apart large sheets of frozen ice to allow transportation, which makes it easier for the ice to melt and harder for it to refreeze in large sheets. Less directly, but more pressing, is humankind's release of smoke and gases, like CO2 and methane, into the air. When sunlight passes through the atmosphere, the gas and particles keep more heat in the Earth's atmosphere and increase the global temperature, especially in the Arctic. The good and bad news is that everything is connected. If we pollute our atmosphere, our land, our freshwater, or our oceans, we will see negative effects everywhere else, too. On the other hand, we can make small steps in every part of our lives that will better everything we interact with. The best thing you can do to help the Earth, its organisms, and its people is to learn. The passage has come a long way through history. It was once shrouded in mystery, superstition, and fairy tale. Later on, its existence was proven, but it still posed a perilous challenge. Now, we approach a time where in the next few decades, it could be a fully open passage. But before you decide to take a cruise up there, think about this quote from the Canadian International Council. The Northwest Passage may be hazardous always, resembling an ice-infested labyrinth, especially during the four months of the year that it is plunged into complete darkness 24 hours a day.